Uh, my name is Robert. I'm going to be talking about procedural macros with the, the NOM library. Uh, actually, before I get started, I'm going to start timing myself because I want to know how long it takes. All right. So I'm going to be talking about uh, writing procedural macros with the, the NOM parser combinator library. So as a sort of a big picture overview, what we're going to be doing is, is taking something that isn't valid uh, for us and turning it into to valid for us. So the idea, um, the thing that I want you to get out of this presentation are an understanding of procedural macros, everything from like what it takes to write them, uh, like how to do that on a very technical level, to like you know what they can do, and to not be afraid of them. When I look at procedural macro syntax, I my head explode, but uh, sorry, not macros by example, my head explode, but procedural macros are more like regular programs, uh, a little bit easier to understand, um, and not nearly as intimidating, also more powerful. Uh, I want you to have a high level understanding of what parser combinators are, or parsers plus combinators. Uh, it's not a particularly difficult uh, concept, it just sounds it, because it sounds very like computer science-y, so if you, you know, haven't been to like a Haskell meetup or something, you're like, I've never heard of that, I've never done it, so. Uh, it's not that bad. And then we're going to build a recursive uh, descent parser. So, to begin, what we're going to be doing is taking this, which is, like I said, not valid Rust syntax at all, and uh, through a series of steps, turning it into this. So, um, what we're looking at right here is not an HTML token, not the, rep not the representation of an HTML token, but uh, a representation of how we actually construct an HTML token. So instead of you know instead of this being an attribute uh, hash map up there, we actually have to create a hash map calling called hash map colon colon new, insert things into it, and then uh, make the value of a set of braces the, the actual hash map. Uh, so basically, when we're working with macros, there's a level of indirection. Uh, you can't actually just return the, the data structure, uh, which is a little bit easier conceptually, and, and you can rely upon the compiler and the type checker much more uh, if you were doing that. You actually have to write code uh, that creates this data structure. So basically, I know memes, a few of them, so thank you for the humorous laugh. Uh, so <laughs> macros are programs that turn programs into other programs. Um, so basically that's like what metaprogramming is. It's programming related to programs, right? Um, and like we said, in Rust there are two types of macros, procedural and uh, declarative macros. So if you've ever looked at declarative macros, there's a lot of like dollar sign expression and, and matching. It's like a complicated match statement. Um, on the other hand, procedural macros take one token stream and turn it into another token stream. So we'll go back to exactly what that means in a little bit. But the final type that we're creating is this HTML token. So if you imagine uh, HTML, what can go in there? It can be a DOM node, it can be a string, and Probably according to the spec, maybe like six other things, but we're going to really be focused on those two things. Uh, so text can be represented as a string, and the DOM element as a DOM element, which is itself a struct, which has a node type. Uh, it's going to have a vector of children, and it's going to hash, uh, have a hash map of attributes. So, like I said, we're not actually going to be creating those types directly. What we're going to be doing is making code like this. Uh, so basically, we're going to be writing code that creates this. So the tool, like the most important tool in our toolkit is this quote macro. So this quote macro takes whatever we give it um, and turns it into a token stream. So uh, the problem with this is that we lose a lot of type information. This token stream here ends up creating a DOM element, but there's no guarantee from the that that's going to be the case. Uh, so, for example, like this is 
perfectly valid uh, you know, compiling Rust code, where on one branch we return a number, and another branch uh, we return a string, which is it's valid, but it's kind of useless. I mean, macros can return different types uh, based upon the situation, but like you generally wouldn't want to do this kind of thing. So in general, we like have to be pretty careful when it comes to working with control macros. Uh, and when we look at actual code, you'll see why. Because we're going to start nesting quote inside of quote, and there's almost no safety. And honestly, if there's a better way to do this, uh, I'm all ears. I, uh, I still have to find this program on that. That Rust library and Rust I don't know. This is, um, I've never done anything in Aspen, so. Uh, this does have quasi quoting. So like, you can bring in, um, you can bring in external variables into this. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll make this point that out when we're looking at Aspen. Yeah? Where is this full add coming from? This is a, uh, it's, it's just an external frame. Bring it in. Uh, it doesn't show for it. Alright, so let's get to the nitty gritty of what it actually means to build a procedural macro. So the important things are that this lives in, your procedural macro has to live in a, in a separate phrase. It has to have in its cargo tunnel uh, this lib prop macro equals true thing. And then the actual function needs to be exported, and it needs to have this uh, prop macro annotation. And the actual function takes a token stream and returns another token stream. So let's think about, let's, let's discuss what a token stream actually is. So if I run JSX, the macro, with uh, you know, this code here, uh, this is the token stream that I've passed. It's a little bit of a simplified uh, version of it, but essentially we get something like um, an iterator over uh, a bunch of separate token trees, so a pump, an ident, a pump, an ident, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and each of these represents one, you know, like one atom in our code. So you might have heard in the past that uh, all Rust macros have to be balanced in terms of parentheses, curly braces, and square brackets, and you would be right. And that's also represented in the token stream. So for example, if we bring in curly braces and uh, have something on the inside, the, the token tree that we get representing that piece is actually a group, which itself has a substring. Uh, so this is nice because one of the key features of, of JSX uh, that we want to implement is the ability to interpolate other values. And that's going to be really easy because all of those values are already going to be grouped into this uh, uh, group token tree. So we just handle it, handle a group whenever we encounter one, and basically that's that's really easy now. There's a lot less to handle. So this also means that for our question, yeah. So there's four delimiters, and it's just a number. Um, there's uh, curly braces, there's square brackets, there's parentheses, and then there's none. Um, I don't really know what the use case is for none, but you can also group things around. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know of any way to like change. Uh, so Matt, so Rust gives you a token stream. I don't know if you can like tell Rust like, hey, for the duration of this macro, like also use angle brackets as a grouping thing, or also use, you know, or don't use curly. I don't know. I don't think so. Yes. Yeah. If if they're not balanced, then like then Rust will refuse to even execute your your product. Oh yeah. Um, so this this uh, delimiter field here is, is accessible in your uh, procedural macro. So uh, you can do whatever you want. Like that. You can check on it and change it. So. Um, so this is valid here. Like according to what we just discussed, like using curlies, you can interpolate whatever you want. So if you do this, this should this should be valid JSX for the 
for the purposes of our uh, of this presentation. Uh, so a token stream is an iterator over token trees, and a token tree has four uh, four types. There is an enum with four types: uh, a pumped, an eigens, a group, and a literal. So a literal is anything like a string, a number, a character. Uh, a group is anything that's surrounded by curlies or uh, parentheses or, or square brackets. An ident is anything that's like a name or like a, a single word. And a pump is, you know, forward slashes, less than sign, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so a very simple procedural macro, one that just takes whatever you give it and returns the string foo would be as follows. Uh, we start by constructing a literal string foo, turning it into a token tree, and then turning that token tree into a token string. Uh, there, that's all there is to it. Uh, my presentation is over, any questions? So, uh, clearly you wanna do more stuff with, with procedural macros, and if we're not gonna be like building them up piece by piece like that, uh, we need to have some stronger, uh, more powerful tools. Uh, and for this, we're going to be using the non library, which is a parser combinator library. And it's, it's, it's nice, I like it. Uh, so, what is a parser? A parser is something that takes an iterator, think of that as just like it's an array of characters in the most simple case, and returns an i result. Um, and this is just a wrapper around. Uh, success, in which case the value is whatever you parse plus the remaining result, or uh, a failure, like you did not parse, if we're attempting to parse numbers, we're given a bunch of characters that uh, you might not succeed in parsing. Error, we ran out of input, we're not going to be dealing with that in this presentation. Um, and an error, like fatal error, fail out, like we are 100% certain that this thing is not going to parse and stop early. Also, don't care about that for the purposes of this presentation. So, non-parsers, the ones that it ships with, uh, work on slices of characters, which are not token trees. So that means that we're actually going to be writing our own parsers for this presentation. Not as simple as it sounds. Really, it's just returning a result uh, based on you know a particular stack. So, let's take a look at a simple example. Like, what would a, a match numbers parser look like. I'll leave it unimplemented because it's not super interesting, but in terms of its API, it would take a string and return uh, OK in this case with uh, the value that was uh, the remaining value plus whatever it parsed here. And that's all we're going to be doing for all of these parsers. So an actual parser that we're going to be using in this uh, that we're going to be using in this uh, in the code is something that matches a little bit. So, lucky for us, yeah. Uh, just for that type, so it's a higher default. Yeah. For us, we have higher parsing types. We try to normalize matching parse number or types like that. Or are you going to So, this is, uh, so it's just a type alias for a result. So, my type is it. Yeah. I don't know about this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody else can answer that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, Rust does not have higher number types. Uh, they opt for an associated type constructor, so I think it still works. There's your answer. All right. Uh, so because Rust has done all the tokens in, uh, tokenizing for us, we're actually only going to be looking at the first element, uh, in this case, input zero. Uh, so if the input so we're going to match over the first element of the input, and if it's a literal, what we're going to do is return OK with the remaining values of the of the token tree slice and uh, and, and the literal itself. And I, I'm cloning it because I don't particularly care about the borrower errors. I think I can work around that if I try, um, but I haven't worried about it. And then this get error uh, call here, uh, the natural code is just like a long line. Doesn't make it easy to return errors, and like, um, you don't have to worry about that. So, cool. So, 
at the extremely low level, we're going to have a bunch of parsers, like ones that match, that match like an opening, uh, an opening angle bracket, a forward slash, an ident, you know, whatever. Um, and we need some way to take those and build something up that's more complicated that eventually becomes the JSX parser. So for that, we're going to do we're going to use what are called combinators. So combinators, uh, it's a fancy word for combining multiple functions to make more complicated functions. Uh, so basically, it's just higher order functions. And parser combinators are combinators that combine multiple parsers into something that's more complicated. And eventually, we're going to use enough of these to make our JSX parser. Uh, and this is going to be called a recursive descent parser. Uh, and the reason for that is because at the very top level it's a parser, that's going to call a sub-parser, and recursively all the way down, it's going to call a bunch of parsers. So it's a recursive descent parser. Uh, so, just press that slightly so I have to transition to the next slide. Uh, so one example parser can be uh, delimited. Uh, so this parser, takes three parsers, uh, sorry, this combinator takes three parsers, an opening parser, a middle parser, and a closing parser, and it throws away the value of the first and the third one and returns the result of, of the middle one, assuming all three, uh, uh, assuming all three parsers succeeded. So, uh, an example of how we would use that, you might have like delimited, followed by a parser that matches an open angle bracket and a forward slash, followed by a parser that matches an ident, uh, followed by something that matches a closing angle bracket. So this, uh, this combination would be something that matched uh, a closing HTML tag. Uh, and the astute in the audience might notice that there's actually two combinators on this page. Both the limited and pair are combinators. Pair, in this case, takes two combinators. It both succeed. It returns a tuple of the values of Uh, you can override addition and stuff like that, but you can't uh, define custom operators. Like you can't like use uh, angle uh, and things like that to make up a make like a halt combinator or something like that. And, uh, although not exactly the way you're thinking, but like, you can use macros to basically have macros can have basically any syntax you want as long as the brackets are matched. Uh, so, other combinators that we're going to be using, tuple, it matches as many of uh, them as you want, pretty good. returns the results in a tuple if all of them match. Map, which uh, takes, uh, applies a function to uh, you know, a parser that was successful, uh, many, zero, many, one. Uh, this matches a parser as many times as it will go, uh, at least zero or at least one time. In our case, we're using a custom version of that because mom's uh, macros assume that you're working on a uh, on, on a, uh, a vector of characters. We're not doing that, or a slice of characters. We're not doing that, so we have to we have to on that one. Uh, alt alt lets you uh, chooses the first it returns the results of the first parser that matches. Uh, opt which takes a, a parser, makes it optional, and returns an option of the results of that parser. Uh, complete. Remember how we said that uh, parsers return the value that they parse plus whatever remains in the uh, string? Complete will turn anything that uh, has any characters or tokens remaining and uh, turn that into an error. So basically, it has to, it has to be, you wrap complete around the final JSX parser to make sure that there's not like, extra characters. There's also these three things, call, apply, and main, which if you look at them, you don't really have to worry about them. They're just ways of us of wrapping functions so that uh, Nom knows about them and giving, giving combinators names so that we can refer to them elsewhere. Just, uh, don't worry about that unless you're actually using it, unless you're actually using Nom. Um, apply, like the name implies, also lets you curry the function. So, We'll see a few places where we're doing something like match pumped, and then we'll, we'll pass it a uh, an opening uh, angle bracket. So instead of having 
you know, like match open angle bracket parser and match forward slash parser and all that stuff. We'll just have a single one, and every time we use it, we'll, we'll use a different fly. All right. So I've alluded to this before, but in terms of strategy, there's there's two ways to go about what we're trying to do. One is to start from the bottom, build up from these smaller parsers, um, you know, make it match on something. It's like a small subset of our, our spec, build those up, and so on and so forth until it bubbles up into something that we might call like a JSX parser. The other strategy, which is one that I'm going to employ, is to start from the top and have parsers, uh, for example, an alt parser, where each of the elements always stands. And then slowly we start filling in the pieces. Uh, for the both of these are good strategies. In my case, I just felt like doing it this way, so that's how we did it. So that means that we know, to begin with, that the final code, like the outermost, the, the entry into our um, JSX macro is going to be this. It's going to match an HTML token, which, as we know, is either going to be string or a DOM element or a group, because the group is for interpolation. And each of these three, is going to be is going to start off with a stub that just always fails. Um, cool. Exactly. All right. Does anybody have any questions before I uh, change tab? All right. Um, yeah. The actual difference in the second part is that would be the same. Is that one not the one? Is that the same one? There are. So, NOM is a bunch of macros that help you make a recursive descent parser, and the actual recursive descent parser is just a function. Um, well, then a mark it also comes with a bunch of parsers. So, like, you can start with their parsers and combine and make something more complicated. We can't do that because other parsers assume they were. Um, maybe, but I, I didn't. I didn't succeed with that. So uh, I also haven't used non brain inside of this. So uh, it seems like so. The, the technical reason is that in a lot of cases it assumes that um, the vector of characters is comparable to has like partial equal, uh, partial equality defined on it, and token strings don't have that. So a lot of the parsers that they're dealing with, uh, uh, it's like on the actual strings. No, no, no. Uh, okay. in, in Rust, you can compare actualized vectors. It just compares the Rust. Yeah, yeah, sure. Compare actualized. I mean, there's no actual string. Oh, sorry. The string is not open ended. It's, it's oh, yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, yeah. I'll, I'll show you that. Uh, so. First thing that we'll do is I want to just implement by hand a, uh, a take character uh, parser. So remember that what this parser has to do is um, it has to return a parser result, and that parser result is going to be okay with the remaining values on the, uh, on the cars, the remaining cars, and the car that it matched if it succeeded, and otherwise it returns an error. So in this case, what we're going to do is something like this. So um, let first car opt equals um, cars dot next. So first cars, since cars might be of length zero, um, it's going to return an option when we try to get the, the next value. So we're going to match on first car opt. And if it's sum, we're going to have a character there. Um, and then we do something like if first character is equal to C, we want to return OK. Uh, the remaining values are now in cars. Cards up next is a method that we takes it uh, along with C or, or first C, it doesn't really matter. And otherwise, we return air. And then in the error, in the uh, not case, we also just want to return here. So, not particularly difficult. Uh, a 
little bit, you know, it can be a little bit, uh, it, it's easier to use uh, macros for all this stuff, but like not particularly this one. So when we run this on um, food right here, and we try to take character F and take character C, what we're going to expect is that in the first case it succeeds and in the second case it fails. So not surprisingly, when we run this, huh, I, had, oh, I didn't save. Not surprisingly, I didn't save your code. Uh, so not surprisingly, in the first case it succeeds, it gives us the remaining values from here and the character uh, that we matched on, and in the error case, it's just a perfect error. So, pretty simple. Now let's, uh, now let's implement an alt combinator. So remember, an alt combinator uh, returns the values of the first parser if it succeeds, and otherwise returns, sorry, an alt combinator returns a function which returns the values of the first parser if it succeeds, and otherwise returns the values of the second parser. So when it's said out loud like that, it's, it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. So we're going to return a function, or a closure in this case. Uh, it's going to be moved because it needs to it needs to move P1 and P2 into the into the closure. Uh, so let's see, let, let result equals P1 cars, or clone cars. Um, I think if we, if our functions took references to cars, uh, we wouldn't have to clone it, but I didn't do that. It doesn't really matter for these cases. Uh, so now we're going to match on results. And okay, we want to pair up the value, we're going to return the result. That means that P1 succeeded. And in the error case, we also don't care about the error. We're going to return. Uh, P2, call up cars clone. Uh, that should be it. So now, when we actually call this, we can call alt combinator on these guys. Take care for C or take care of F. So we would expect that the return, the what we print out, is the remainder of the vector followed by um, F. So. Not surprisingly, because I've tested this out before, what happens is that we actually get that. Yeah? What was that location A variable? Uh, oh, so this is a lifetime here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Rust keeps track of like how long a variable is in scope. Um, and in this case, it says that the return value, uh, the parser result, is alive for at most as long as this cars, uh, as most as long as this cars there, at least. Uh, I was right. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Anyway, the point is there. It, it needs to know that like this uh, this guy won't be deallocated. Well, this one is still referenced, um, and therefore we're going to have a use that one free. Um, so, anyway, so like at, at low level, like building parsers and building combinators, not particularly difficult. But nonetheless, a lot easier if you end up using libraries. So that's that's the, the low level demonstration part of this stuff. Um, and what we're going to check, what we're going to take a look at, is now the final code. Uh, that deals with parsing. Uh, that deals with parsing uh, JSNs. So if we run this, um, what we're going to see is that we print out it, the macro prints out three things. One is the tokens that we get. Two is the tokens that uh, we return. Then also uh, those tokens string by. So in this case, what we see is that we start with these. Uh, we start with this uh, token of JSX stuff, an opening character, a div, uh, a div, which is an ident, a closing 
uh, pumped, which is the uh, closing angle bracket and so on. And what we end up returning is something vastly more complicated, which when stringified turns into this, which if you squint and like, you know, add line breaks in the appropriate locations, you'll see that um, what this is, is is something that creates a domino. So let's take a look at how this is actually done as a uh, So we know that the entry point to this is going to be match HTML token. So in this case, we know that an HTML token is either a DOM element or a string uh, or a bracketed uh, or a set of bracket or a set of braces around something else. So uh, we start with this, and now let's you know recurse into these. So let's take a look at what match DOM element. Match DOM element itself is also a, a parser that is either a self-closing tag or a tag. Uh, and this match tag here is itself a parser that matches an opening tab tag, matches as many HTML tokens uh, as you can, followed by matching the closing tag. I have a to-do here to check that the opening tag and the closing tag are of the same type. I don't actually do that. Just whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and so what you'll notice about this is that this is, you know, this is recursive in the sense that you can have HTML tokens inside of HTML tokens inside of HTML tokens, right? Um, what you would expect, basically. So let's take a look at this generate DOM element tokens. Uh, so this is something, this function ends up creating a, creating the code that writes the DOM element. So when I told you earlier that it's a hassle to work with the quote macro because it's dangerous, this is basically exactly why. And I'm sorry that there's a lot of code on here and I'm scrolling very quickly. I'll try not to scroll here while I explain what's going on. So we've matched on attributes. So we have a vector of attributes which are uh, a vector of string, string, tuples, where the first string is the name of the attribute and the second string is the value. So if this isn't, if we don't have any attributes, then we have this uh, zero case where we can just return a hash map directly. Uh, if we have more than one, uh, if we have at least one attribute, then we create these three, um, we create three quotes. Uh, three token strings. Uh, the first one, we initialize an attribute map. The second one, we iterate through the attributes and assign them. Uh, we insert them into the attribute map. And in the third case, we, you know, we return the attribute map or whatever that would actually be in this case. And then in the end, we group all of them together into a set of curlies so that the, the value of what's going on in the curlies is the attribute map. So when I said that this isn't very type safe, what I meant is that uh, you don't actually know whether you've messed up at compile time. So for example, in this case, we do attribute map two, like a variable that doesn't clearly doesn't exist, and we run this, uh, it still parses. And the reason that it still parses is because our JSX doesn't have any attributes. So that means that, you know, once, but once we add an attribute, it's gonna fail. Did you mean attribute map, no attribute map too? So we're kind of back to the old, like, you need a bunch of tests to cover all the edge cases of your macro. Kind of annoying, kind of know why I, I joined Rust, uh, or I started coding Rust, so. There might be a better pattern um, that really does test these cases comprehensively, but. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. So I think that when it comes to uh, when it comes to macros, you just have to like, really worry and, and, and be very careful. Uh, the other thing is that you might think that like this second half here is fine. Um, why wouldn't we just always have uh, why do we need a special case for zero, right? Uh, and the answer is that if we run this, it runs. 
Is that what? Ah, there we go. Oh, yeah, okay, there we go. All right. Uh, so let me go. Thank you. Appreciate your eagle eyes. Yes, it should just come All right. So you might think, what do we need that zero case for? Uh, this, this entire, this, this case works well. And you'd be right. Then you take away these attributes, and all of a sudden, the actual code that comes out is, oh, I didn't want this time. Um, it should warn, because we're using, we're making an attribute map which is mutable, and then never mutating it. So other times the Rust compiler would, would warn about that. Um, so basically there's just a lot of like, you just kind of have to deal with these things. All right, so let's undo all my changes. All right. Um, yeah, basically it's macros all the way down. The, uh, the remaining sort of the, the next steps for like sort of what I, what I want this JSX parser to be is I want to hook it up to WebAssembly and actually render this in the browser. I had that going um, a couple weeks ago, but if you've been following along with the uh, nightly compiler, the proc macro interface changed dramatically between when I wrote that and this presentation, so that part doesn't work. Uh, so one of the costs of working with procedural macros now is it hasn't stabilized, so beware. Uh, secondly, uh, in this JSX macro, I handle strings in a completely haphazard, like ridiculous fashion. If I, if you take a look at, um, add something like, add a bunch of spaces here, blue and below, um, you'll see that when I actually run this, it's got only one space here. Because I'm just taking a bunch of items, mapping them, and joining them with a single screen. So we take extra work for me to figure out, based on their spans and based on their location, like what the actual spacing is. Uh, and also, Rust, I actually don't know if Rust will keep track of whether my spaces are tabs or whether they're spaces. So in terms of HTML, maybe that matters. I don't know, but in terms of a presentation, it doesn't. Um, so also, in my code, error handling is non-existent. And balanced parentheses and stuff are required by Rust but not by HTML. So I don't really know what the best case is, but like if you want to add a, uh, a close uh, sad face into your, into your HTML, like this might be the best option that we have right now, I'm not exactly sure. This would also interpolate a space between your colon and your, uh, and your sad face. So not the end of the world, but uh, no, that's, that's where I'm at. Um, that's procedural macros. 